It is my pleasure. I'm going to move this a little bit so you're seeing me a little more. It is my pleasure, uh, as soon as I figure this out. <laughs> ah, got it. Okay. Not sure what happened there. You're giving previews of wow. my slides. Okay, let's see here. I got okay. it. I got it. Okay. You might want to click the slideshow. I did. I just got to fix it. Screen up there. Just, yeah. If you're so frustrated with that, just yeah, touch it. Fix it. You want your opening? What happened to the mouse? It gets stuck there. Yeah, there's a there's a dot. Okay, yeah. if you want to click the screen right here, and then that will go to a screen. Yeah. <laughs> you got these those circles things and usually I slide them off. I know I do. What are we needing to do? We need to go to slide one. If, you, if like you click the screen, you're just gonna, it'll be full screen. Yeah, we're just trying to get it quick. That's all. We go. Okay. Okay, now we want to hide we this, to don't we? Um, and all she has to do is here to go advance. Well, yeah, but I need to get rid of this thing. Careful. <laughs> why, do you, why do you get rid of that? Oh, it's not showing up. Okay, never mind. Okay, can everybody, yeah, everybody can hear me. So we're having some technological challenges today, but we shall go forth and conquer. Uh, it, is, it is a delight for me to introduce our speaker, Deb Lambert. I thought about this when things were going hot and heavy up in Fishers, that maybe librarians are facing so many challenges today that it would be a good topic to have a speaker who is a librarian who could address those from the other side of the aisle, so to speak, the librarian side, uh, and all of the controversies and challenges that are going on in today's world. Uh, I was able to, the library, uh, Indianapolis Public Library, connected me uh, with Deb Lambert, who is the Director of Collections Management for the Indianapolis Public Library System. Uh, she is passionate about building equitable and relevant collections. Uh, her experiences are extensive and include extensive and automation administration, supervisory, circulation, and collection management experience in academia and in special and public libraries, including large multi-branch systems such as the Indianapolis Public Library System. It is, rather than listening to me, I'm sure you would rather listen to, listen to her. The way we have set this up is that Deb is going to give a presentation and then we'll take questions. So if you want to submit questions, Janet, can you keep track of the questions that are offered? Uh, yes. I can. yes. Uh, so if questions are offered, put them in the chat uh, room or here in pr the present area. She, you can just hold up her, uh, your hand when she's done. And uh, so it is, as I said, a delight to introduce Deb Lambert. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a delight to be here. I'm, I'm honored to come and speak with you. And, and listening to the last, um, you know, 15 minutes of your meeting, I'm pleasantly surprised about your knowledge about the library system and libraries across the um, the state. So some of what I have in my presentations, you already you already know, and and that was a, a pleasant surprise. Um, so 
Stephen asked me to talk about challenges facing librarians in today's world. My perspective um, comes from collection side of things, but I also can speak to you other parts of what we're facing in, in the public library. Um, just really quick overview about Indianapolis Public Library um, is that we have uh, 26 locations, including one central library and two bookmobiles. We um, have the Center for Black Literature and Culture. Um, this year we're celebrating our 150th year in business. And um, some facts about um, the community that we serve is about 970,000 residents, which includes all of Marion County. Um, we have 2 million, about 2 million on-site visits um, post pandemic. And we're hoping to boost that some more as we get back to business. Um, total circulation is about 7 million and our annual budget is 79 million. One thing I didn't put on here is our collection budget is 6 million with another um, million in grants and uh, endowments and things like that. Um, to give you a concept of the size, we have about 600 employees and in the collection management area, I have about 55 to 60 employees that work with the collection, ordering it, um, cataloging it, delivering it through the shipping and receiving courier system and our electronic digital collections as well. Um, so I'm gonna give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about today and then we'll get into the details about it. So the big elephant in the room is censorship and it leads into legislative control um, of libraries, but they're trying to pass through um, legislature all over the country. Um, similarly related to politics and library boards and school boards, social issues that are affecting libraries. Um, Ebook licensing costs is a surprising um, thing here, um, which leads into budget challenges for us. And then those are overview of the challenges and then other topics I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, is that it's uh, not all really negative. We've got some great new things happening at NDPL and at other libraries across the system. I'm giving you examples of NDPL because those are the ones I'm aware of. And um, then I'm gonna talk about, um, as Steve asked me, um, how, to, how do libraries select materials for their collection and how do you market um, books to the to libraries for them to carry your books. So I'm gonna take just a quick two minutes to uh, show this video. I'm hoping sound is gonna work. <laughs> um, there was a Senate Judiciary hearing, um, not now, there we go. The first week of September that talked about book bans and censorship. I am not hearing any sound on this. Are you able to turn on? Yes. Your sound, Janet? I unmuted my You can turn it off. I got it. Can you turn your sound off?
Okay. Um, really impactful video, and I'll share the link with you in my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so you can take a look at it later. But um, that started with a 1954 Senate Judiciary hearing that our 2023 Senate Judiciary hearing presented um, at the early in September. And they were talking about a comic book that was banned. Anybody have a guess at what comic book they were trying to ban in 1954 because it promoted juvenile delinquency? Superman, you've got it. Wow, very knowledgeable. Yes, so imagine that. I mean, Superman made it to, to the Senate hearing. All right, I'm trying to get out of this and get back to my presentation. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so censorship um, is on fire. I would say not just on the rise, but on fire. If you can see how much it's changed since 2003 and it made a huge climb in 2020, uh, one in 2022, and it's the number of challenges has increased um, exponentially. The number of individual titles has increased by 38%. So what that's I'm saying- sorry, I'm folks aren't seeing that slide. Presentation. Okay, stop share. And share screen. That should work. How about now? It's back, yes. Okay, sorry about that. It's okay. All righty. So um, the number of unique titles is only up 38%, but the number of challenges overall is exponentially. That means the same titles are being challenged, a lot of the same titles. They have increased, but um, there's a theme around a lot of these titles. Um, On this slide, I'm going to point to the, the graph on the right, um, and that's nationally. It shows that the, um, the increase of the trend shows that more political and religious groups are submitting challenges. I mean, the top categories of parents and uh, patrons is still the highest, but the next highest group are uh, political and religious groups that are campaigning and sending in challenges to libraries across the country. Um, and then board. Sorry, can I ask a question about that data? Um, how do you distinguish between patrons who might also be part of the political and religious groups and parents who might be part of those same groups? If, if they self-identify on their forms, on their challenge forms, if they self-identify as a, a political or religious group or a, a you know a administrator. So um, they might also say they're parents as well. So there might be overlap in the data, but that is national data. And I I wouldn't um, know how they exactly categorize it. So a group, I forget the name of moms. moms for Liberty. Moms mm -hmm. for Liberty. So if they're challenging, they probably, they may very well identify as parents when in fact they're a political actor. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's where I, that's why I was asking. Right, so they could be, you know, dishonest on their forms as well, right? But what we're seeing is people from political groups from other parts of, that aren't residents of the community trying to file challenges. Our challenges require them to be a resident of Marion County. More libraries are starting to put that restriction on, but for a while they weren't. And so they were, you know, from Utah or Nevada and, you know, challenging Indianapolis, you know, materials. Um, the other graph on this uh, slide is showing the number of requests that we faced um, for the last five years. So far this year, we've had three challenges. Last year, we had six. And I should say these are formal challenges where they submitted a form. Um, we get many, many requests and discussions at all of our locations where librarians talk to them one-on-one -on -one and explain to them why we have a diverse collection. And um, we want materials that represent everybody, that people can come in and see themselves in the collection. So a lot of our librarians do a great job of um, maybe answering the questions and calming people down and they, they go away. But the ones who are very insistent will have will file a formal request. Yes? Um, are there age Right. I'm going to repeat the question for the, the folks online. 
Um, the question is, are there age restrictions on checking out materials for adults or teen or children? And uh, the answer is no. Our library cards, um, actually the ch children's card restrict checking out um, adult DVDs, meaning not, you know, X-rated DVDs, but R-rated DVDs and PG-13 uh, DVDs, they can only check out PG. So that's the only age restriction we have. Um, we do have separate uh, parts of our library that are designed for children's collection and teen collection and adult collection and services in those areas designed for those audiences. Um, so, and, and assistance from, from library staff to use the collection as well. But if a teen, um, whether they have a permission from a parent or not, goes into the adult collection to find a classic book, you know, there's a lot of, you know, adult classics that are taught in high school that are not considered teen books. Um, Scarlet Letter, Letter, you know, Catcher in the Rye, those are adult books, but they are taught in schools. So putting a, um, a uh, age restriction on cards creates a barrier for, for our students to be able to, you know, get the materials that they need. Bless you. Um, <clears throat> does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, I, I There's a lot of um, uh, panic, uh, moral panic about, you know, sex books in libraries when it's really not as common as, as you would think. Um, but um, the one thing that I wanted to add was that um, a lot of parents, we, our policy is that parents are responsible for knowing what their children are reading, whether it's in their school library, their public library. What they're doing in this building is up to the responsibility of the parents. And there are a lot of parents that are okay with them reading outside of their age range. Um, because you have, you know, young kids on, you know, that are 11, 10, sorry, 11, 12, that are ready to read, you know, books in the teen collection. So we want the parents to make that decision and not the library to make that decision or um, political activists, of course. <laughs> so um, that doesn't seem like a big number, but the process for, um, doing this, the challenge, I'll get to that in a minute, um, is a big lift for the library. First, I want to talk about the top 10 national challenges. I put a red check mark next to the ones that have been challenged at Indianapolis Public Library, um, but we are hearing about all of these titles. And um, the thing that's most common about these are they're uh, considered sexually explicit passages in them, and there's a lot of them with LGBTQ plus uh, themes in them. Um, John Green, as we all know, has been pretty vocal about that recently, and one of his books is on here, Looking for Alaska. And then the second slide is the um, remaining in the top 10. Um, Lawn Boy and Crank are uh, two of the ones that have been challenged at our library. And I think absolutely true Diary of a Part-Time Indian was challenged about 10 years ago, but I didn't go back that far in the files. Um, again, um, LGBTQ plus content, sexually explicit content, but also drug use um, appears on here as well. Um, so I want to talk about how we handle uh, challenges when they come to us. Um, and more, and li more libraries are leveling up to being a, a very formal process like this. It used to be that um, the selector who purchased it and myself would review all the information about it and make a decision. Um, and that was the end of it. But with the challenges that we've had lately, uh-oh, we're running low on power over here. <laughs> um, anyways, um, so we've had to, you know, become more formalized with it. We have people saying, well, I don't like that decision. You know, I want to appeal it. So um, we've decided to bring more voices into the review of the books. And so the selector who purchased it, um, and our selectors are divided into ages and areas. So we have an adult nonfiction selector, adult fiction selector, children's uh, selector, and teen and AV selector, and then a world language selector. 
So that person for that particular area is on that committee. And then we pull in librarians throughout the whole um, system that are working in public services area that work with patrons, you know, directly one on one. And if it's a children's book, it would be a children's librarian. If it's got an LGBTQ plus theme in it, we want to have an LGBTQ plus representative on the committee. If it's um, I have an African American um, theme like um, the bluest eye, we want to make sure we have representatives on that co um, committee. So that ad hoc, sorry, ad hoc committee reads and views the work in its entirety. We asked the patron who reviewed it, who submitted the challenge to read it in its entirety, but most of the time they do not because they're just taking one little snippet out of it and not looking at the work as a whole. And that's what we do is we consider the work as a whole. And um, the definition of harmful to minors takes the whole work in, into account as well. So that's part of why we do that. And then that, that committee um, researches all the reviews and the awards and any news that's out, out about it. And then we review peer library holdings. So we wanna see what other libraries like us have the book. We also look at how much it's been used in the time that we've had it. Some of these challenges are from 2003 and it's used, been used you know, hundreds of times since then. Um, and that adds to our you know, understanding that all these people found value in it. Um, and then we also consider whether the title meets our uh, selection policy and our strategic plan. And a lot of these challenges specifically for LGBTQ plus go against our strategic plan because we, our mission is to be inclusive. Um, that committee makes a decision on whether we're gonna retain it or we're gonna move it. So if it's a children's book that they think should be in, in the teen or the adult collection, that would be a move. Um, again, though, at, you know, moving it to another area may add barriers to the intended audience of the book. And then if the patron is unhappy with that decision, it is then goes to me and, and the CEO um, to make sure that the committee did it, everything that they were supposed to do and that it meets our strategic plan and our selection policy. So it's a lot of work to get, you know, five, six people to read it and do all this work. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll get something on the news and somebody will put us, you know, a, a challenge in for it. They don't realize how much goes into it when they've never even looked at the book. Um, so let me talk about our specific challenges. And they're a little different. Some of them are different than what we saw on that national list. Um, James Patterson, <laughs> the first time I've seen one. This is the most recent challenge. Um, it's a work from 2016. And um, it calls itself Catholic fiction. And the person is offended that they, it calls itself Catholic fiction. The, the author and co-author um, are Catholics, but it's a book about a, a woman becoming a priest and then eventually the Pope, and then a priest um, wanting to her marry another priest. And so those are non-Catholic values. So this person you know, finds the book offensive because it's what she considers non-Catholic. Yes, ma'am. Was that based on one person's opinion? Uh, that it was non-Catholic? Right. Yeah, that's what a challenge is. It's one person usually, one person. but sometimes it's this political group, but this time it was one of our patrons. Mm -hmm. um, down here in Beach Grove, by the way. <laughs> um, and then the second one is a book called, um, Can We Please Give the Police Departments to the Grandmothers? It's a children's book, it's a picture book, and it has um, the adverb badass, a badass grandma in it. And that they want it pulled out of the children's collection and put into the adult collection uh, for that reason. Yep. And that's a two, 2023 children's book. And it is um, a, um, a DEI title um, written by and for African-Americans. And then the next one, The Queer Bible, is a, uh, a lovely book of essays by queer icons about queer icons, such as Elton John writing about divine, and there's nothing sexual about it. Um, and this challenge was simply because the person saw the title, the queer in the title, and they we have still have to go through that formal process. And then um, Barking Dogs Never Bite is a Korean film. Sorry, to, I had to throw a film in here. <laughs> um, and it is uh, written by the, uh, you know, a well-known director now who wrote, who directed Parasite and Snowpiercer and won awards for it. Um, this is one of his earlier films and people who loved his work, the later things, wanted to, you know, see his earlier works. 
But in the story, it's about this dog that is annoying one guy and, and it implies that he threw her over the you know edge of a high rise building. Also, there's implications of uh, people, homeless people eating dogs. Um, <clears throat> There's a beginning, you know, warning, big warning at the beginning. It says no harms, no dogs were harmed in the making of this movie. But still, the person was very offended by this. And this comes into where we, we get quite a few challenges when people look at our foreign film collection or our world language collection, translations of things, and they don't understand cultural differences from other countries. Um, which leads us to this, yes, sir. Which is interesting because there is the dog cat face. Uh huh. Right. Dog pate yeah, season for more of the roses. Uh, ben Stiller movie. What's the name of it? Brett Favre has a cameo in it. Uh, he bounces the ball and it goes out the window and the dog chases. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, yep. Yep. And then that's a double thing. Mm hmm. Something about Mary, a comedy where the, the poor little poodle was electrocuted and thrown out a window and it was all for comedy. Um, so there are lots of examples in American films. Um, so the next book is Little Red Wolf, which is a French retelling. We have the translated title of it, of Little Red Riding Hood. And it does it from the point of view of the wolves and implies that humans are killed. There's violence in, in, in it towards humans. Um, but it is a children's book. It's a children's fiction book. Um, so a parent was offended by that, um, that it implied death to humans, I guess. <laughs> um, and, you know, just think about all the Hans Christianity, you know, fables, right? <laughs> um, and then we get into this four. Um, these were all from a news story, a Fox News story, um, talking about the sex that was in these books. Um, Later Gator, Lawn Boy, Crank, and Gender Queer. And three out of the four, um, I forgot my check marks, where'd they go? <laughs> um, uh, appeared on that national list. And they do include sexually explicit scenes or excerpts and um, Crank has drugs in it. And one of them, actually two of them have LGBTQ plus content in them. And um, this is an example of, oh, Gender Queer and Lawn Boy are in our adult collection, by the way. We don't have it in our teen collection. And other libraries are, running into challenges because they have those in their teen collections, but we considered it above a uh, teen audience. Um, Later Gator and Crank are, um, Crank is an award-winning, you know, uh, book and verse about uh, uh, the struggle of a teen and her mother. And then Later Gator from, I thought it was earlier than two, 2014, but it was one of the first books told in um, emojis and text lingo. <laughs> Um, and there are implications of sex in it, um, but it, it is meant for that audience, older teens. Um, so that's my section on censorship, leading into legislative control for libraries. And there were 146 bills introduced across the country in 2023, going into 2024, um, in eight categories, dealing with libraries. Um, limiting access to school library databases, because if you search sex in one of them, you might get a sex education article in it. Um, establishing book rating systems. I'm sure as authors, you would understand how challenging that would be, right? Um, it's not like a film, uh, you know, an hour and a half film that you're, you're rating. Um, mandating or prescribing material challenges uh, policies, which we have one set up already, but that was in the Indiana law. Again, the red check marks indicate that it was in, um, uh, Indianapolis or Indiana's law, um, efforts to regulate collection development policies, uh, use of parental control policies to limit free speech, uh, changes to the definition of harmful and uh, to minors and obscenity, which is a national law as well as a state law, and uh, teaching or outlawing, lying, um, I'm sorry, limiting the ability to teach divisive topics. Um, so we're including, you know, um, books about diversity, equity, and inclusion in this and LGBTQ and gender identity and things like that. 
uh, criminalizing librarians and educators by removing longstanding defenses from prosecution that have been exempt under obscenity laws for librarians and teachers. Um, so that leads us specifically to the new Indiana law that was enacted. Um, it goes into effect January 1st of 2024. And um, I spent a lot of time at um, the Capitol listening to these sessions and listening to the debates about it. And this did include public libraries until the very last minute and they pulled public libraries out of it and it wasn't gonna pass if they didn't. Um, so it applies to school libraries. I still wanna go through it because it does have implications for public libraries. Um, it requires things like a web-based catalog, a procedure to request removal of materials and a response and appeal process. You know, we already have that in place. We've had those in place for a while. Um, schools, however, didn't necessarily have that in place. And schools may not make these uh, materials that are harmful to minors or obscene within a school library. And it does remove the statutory defense to criminal prosecution for schools. School librarians could be criminally prosecuted for books, ebooks, and educational resources in their library that are considered harmful to minors. The penalty, are, the criminal charges for this are a felony six with a penalty of six months to 2.5 years in prison and a fine of up to $10,000. So putting librarians in prison for up to two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Have there been uh, preemptive challenges to this law already? No, not yet. No preemptive challenges have been filed. There's um, a lot of discussion, ACLU is involved, in, in, but there's so much going on across the country. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is the definition of harmful to minors. And um, there are four pieces to the law. There's another um, definition of obscenity, which is very similar to this, but I wanna focus on harmful to minors because it applies to schools. And um, so any form of nudity, sexual conduct, sexual excitement, or sadomasochistic abuse, and note the and clause. This means that all four of these elements have to be present in order for it to be considered harmful to minors. So it could have nudity in it, but it might not qualify as harmful to minors. Um, considered as a whole, it appeals to the prurient interest in sex of minors, prurient meaning obsessive interest in sex in, of minors. So a sex ed book isn't necessarily obsessive about sex, It's an instruction book, right? Um, it is patently offensive to prevailing standards in the adult community as a whole with respect to suitable matter for minors. And the last considered as a whole, it lacks sitter, serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. So that's where we, the, the, probably the biggest one here um, is that last item in looking at some of these books that we were looking at here, um, such as um, later Gator. Um, it's not obsessively interested uh, in sex. Uh, it does have offensive scenes in it, but as a whole, it was a new form. It was a new genre, and there's a lot more to the story than just sex. Um, and I don't know, texting is considered a serious literary form, <laughs> but <laughs> it was an interesting, you know, um, yes, form. Pardon? Mm -hmm. were, you know, serious work. Mm -hmm. As he approached a hundred years old, he wrote a novel mm -hmm. that was that consisted exclusively of text messages and emails. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can get much more serious than literature. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes. Getting some of the things. Has someone challenged the Holy Bible? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I say that because some of the things that are depicted here uh, actually are. Yes, in. they are in the Holy Bible. The day that this was passed, I received a challenge for it, but it was specifically for the children's collection. So it was kind of a disqualification um, because the Holy Bible itself and its you know, complete form is not in the children's collection. There are children's version of, of the Bible in there that don't include all those things in there, right? So um, it was a simple response that we don't have it in the, in the children's collection. 
Yeah. The question about the um, third third element there. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that if you have all of those, but Marion County standards might be different from say Hamilton counties or Hancock County? Mm -hmm. So what would be banned? Mm -hmm. uh, you could legitimately yeah, ban in Hancock or 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 Hamilton. Um, <laughs> um, and but it might be like that's our prevailing standards allow that. Yes, different communities can apply these their own way, and it is up to the uh, prosecutor of the county to determine if they can prosecute something. And we think that the uh, Marion County prosecutor would probably say we've got more important things to do, and we're not going to do this. Um, <clears throat> but we do still need to take it seriously because of the seriousness of the penalties. Um, but there are going to be rural, rural parts of Indiana that they're going to take this much more serious. Um, yeah. Holy story. And and also, you know, what are they? What do they have access to on their phones? On you know, on TikTok and Twitter and. Right. So, you know, this question was asked during those legislative discussions and debates, and their response was, we don't have control over what they're, they're, they do on their phones, that's up to their parents, but we do have control over what the library does or what any government right. organization does, and we should, you know, have guidelines, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, you know, I talked about this being for schools, and public libraries were dropped at the last minute. So how is this relevant for us? Well, we have a formal relationship with 59 Indianapolis schools, including the Beach Grove schools, um, school system, the Lawrence Township school system, IPS, we're bringing them on. Um, we've added nine of their libraries this year, and we're adding, I think, another dozen next year. So um, they're using our collection. The shared system is that they use our computers and our checkout system to check out their own books from their library. And they're holdings in their collection show up in our giant shared catalog and all the Indianapolis Public Library materials show up in their catalogs too and they can request, borrow them and have them delivered to their schools and check them out. So it's up to the, the media specialist, librarian at the school to see the books that are coming in that their students have requested and make sure that they understand what the implications of providing these materials to their students are. So if it's an adult book, it's pretty easy to tell. No, we're not checking out adult books to you, unless it's something that's on your classic, you know, literature list, right? But if it's um, <clears throat> urban fiction, um, which has a lot of drug, sex, and that's pretty much all it's about, <laughs> drug, sex, and violence, um, they're going to say no to that. Um, but what about these teen items that are kind of borderline that we think is okay for the public library, but according to the laws, would it be okay for the schools to provide those materials? So um, later Gator is teen fiction, Crank is teen fiction. We want them to completely understand what they're getting from our collection and how to identify them. So we're meeting with um, the school librarians and uh, forming a committee to tell them what we can do. And there may be a way for us to flag certain titles in the collection if they want us to, so that when it comes through, they'll have a warning, hey, watch out for this one, you know, and, and consider whether this would be breaking this law and, and cause a librarian to be um, at risk of getting criminal charges against them. It's ultimately up to the school librarian though. Um, but we they use our collection. We offer this service to them. We want them to be safe when using it. We want their students to be safe. Yes. One more question. Since a lot of these kinds of laws are being passed all over the country, have very many librarians actually been criminally charged that you're aware of? That's a good question. Um, there have been a couple. Um, and, and you know, they're kind of borderline with other things that they did. So it's kind of hard to separate the, the, <clears throat> the challenging materials with whatever other behaviors that they had. Um, but what's happening more is termination of people, of, of staff, or um, turnover of, of leadership of libraries. Um, but Criminal prosecution usually is tied with something else. That's a good question, but I think they're because they're so new, no one's actually 
you know, challenge that whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing about this is what's coming next year. I know that public libraries were dropped in the last session before this was passed. Um, and it was something that some of the legislators really wanted to keep in, in the law. So I am positive it's gonna be coming back as a proposal next year. And I'll be spending a lot of time at those hearings again this year <laughs> um, and fighting that. Um, so let's uh, switch topics and talk about politics and library boards. Um, we are finding that there are activists from all across the country, from groups like Moms for Liberty or the Party for Socialism and Liberty, um, joining library boards so that they can bring their political agendas to the, uh, to the library or to the schools. And that's what's happening at Hamilton East Public Library, to be honest. They're being driven by Moms for Liberty. Um, but we're seeing it all over the place. And that's really... Um, dangerous because there are a lot where the library directors are resigning over it or they're being fired over it and the library board is creating policies which isn't under their role if you look at the indiana um, library board handbook um, they should not be making decisions about operational decisions it's leadership for visionary um, directions and supervision of one person that's the library director or CEO. The tactics that these groups are using are misinformation campaigns, protests outside of the buildings, um, social media slur campaigns, overwhelming and interrupting meetings and board meetings. Um, and it's not just the conservative groups that are doing it, it's also the far left groups. Um, and that's what happened at Indianapolis Public Library um, a couple of years ago. And that was that that group was saying that we weren't doing enough regarding DEI or, and there were accusation, accusations of racism. And um, they used a lot of these tactics um, to, to force a change in our leadership. And it's been a rough couple of years. Um, and as I mentioned, results in the termination or resignation of directors, librarians, teachers, and defunding libraries. And we have had such a massive turnover of library staff at Indianapolis Public Library. Um, seven of our 10, I'm sorry, seven or nine uh, people on the leadership team are new people within the last year. Um, I'm one of the, the holdouts. <laughs> um, and then um, I want to give you a couple of other examples. We talked about, you know, our leadership, but uh, the Kirk Cameron incident. Anybody familiar with the Kirk Cameron incident? Okay, Kirk Cameron was a child star on Growing Pains in the 80s, 90s. Hmm? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bad actor in which way <laughs> is the question. Yes. Uh, and the answer is yes. <laughs> right. Um, and he has um, really joined uh, uh, the mission with Moms for Liberty and those types of groups in uh, making uh, literature more Christian based. And um, we have lots of Christian materials in our library, but we want to make sure we have inclusive Christian materials that don't have hate messages in them. And um, and that's what he and, and Brave Books, his publisher, are pushing forward. They're trying to get rid of the woke agenda and um, they're fighting against uh, LGBTQ plus content in children's books. And so they called us in um, beginning of December and said, we've got this book out. We want to do a story time and we want on your schedule this month. And we book our story times for the whole quarter. <laughs> um, and um, we were all booked up. And unfortunately, the person who answered the phone also said, we're, we're booked up, but also we are looking for representation in our speakers right now. And so they interpreted that to mean that they were not welcome um, as white Christian men to present um, at a story time, I guess. So um, it it ended up um, being a, a slur campaign on um, social media against the library, not being welcoming. And then um, what we did offer him was to rent a meeting room and they did end up showing up and, and um, using one of our meeting rooms. But there was also, you know, games that they played with that. They booked the smallest room, even though they knew they had a large crowd coming when they re realized they had a large cr crowd there that day, we offered them a big, bigger room, and they said, "No, no, we're just fine." And they didn't—they only, you know, talked to a tenth of their crowd probably that day. Um, and um, they misrepresented the library size of their meeting rooms. 
um, saying that we didn't give them the, first, the bigger meeting room, which is, you know, just an outright lie. And they were just playing the media against Indianapolis Public Library, but not NDPL. It was for all libraries that kind of rejected them to say, I want a story time right now. There were 50 libraries that they reached out and none of them said, okay, we'll do it right now. There's a reason for that. We have a process and everything, but um, so that's, you know, one of the incidents that happened recently. And then um, when we heard that they possibly were coming back, we, we reached out to them and said, you're welcome to use our meeting rooms. We're also working on some Christian books displays and um, bookmarks that we'll give out to, you know, your, your attendees and everything. We want to work with you rather than having this adversarial relationship with them. And then, of course, you've all heard about the Hamilton East Library uh, situation. Everybody raise your hands if you've heard about it. Yep. Okay. Everybody's nodding their heads. I can't see you online. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, that really has to do with the takeover of the library board by a, a conservative group that, with an agenda and also with ties to the Hamilton Southeast school system as well. And um, them deciding that they wanted to move teen books out of the teen collection and move them into the adult collection, which a lot of people are like, that's not censorship. What's the big problem? It's still in the library. They can find it. Well, the problem is that you're sending the teens, every single teen to the adult collection where it's gonna be interfiled with definitely inappropriate things for teens, number one. Uh, number two is you're adding barriers um, to you know, reading access for teens who are already reluctant to read. To get them into the library, we wanna create a teen-friendly space and get the materials that's appropriate and targeted for them. Yes? This personal observation, mm -hmm. I, I can support teens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had the opportunity to do some language arts substituting. It is amazing that almost every language arts room that I go into mm -hmm. um, has the John Green books <laughs> in them. Mm -hmm. Yep. John Green's books are award winning. Um, books that that relate to teens and have you know as a whole is a you know a wholesome positive influence for teens and reading and experiencing um challenging life situations right um as a result of what happened in hamilton east we um we put the john green books um on our our um, libby ebook website as featured as uh, free you know usually you have to wait and hold you know place to hold and get in line we put it up as cost per circ so everybody could get a copy of it without waiting in line. Cost us a little extra, but we wanted to say, we support this book and John Green, everybody can check it out um, immediately. And we had um, 300 checkouts in a week of that book um, of uh, uh, The Fault in Our Stars, as well as the audiobook as well. Um, and it, we, we just, we did a social media campaign to promote it as well. When we opened the Fort Bend Library, we had lots of copies there featuring it, saying that we don't agree with what's happening in Hamilton East, basically. Um, <clears throat> so switching topics, social issues are probably a huge thing you may not be aware of. Um, <clears throat> social issues, meaning um, a lot of people who are unhoused um, needing services, um, a lot of drug use and overdoses, not just at downtown library, but also at other libraries, so much so that groups are asking us to put Narcan. Narcan. Are you familiar with Narcan? That's a yeah. um, reversal of overdoses outside the library in, in containers outside the library so that people can you know get to them without having to go in the library or, or when the library is closed. We already have them at most of our libraries along with a defibrillator. Um, and uh, we have used it quite a bit at uh, the central library, but at other libraries as well. Um, but uh, that the increase in opioid overdoses continues to be a horrible thing. And then um, <clears throat> guns in libraries, Indiana Open Gun Law <laughs> has brought that to libraries. They specifically, we've asked them, we campaigned and said, please don't let them come into libraries, an educational place, lots of kids here and everything. And we were denied. They said they are not exempt from this law. They used to be exempt, but they are no longer exempt. So uh, yes, exactly. The state house still is. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. So wait a minute. We can open carry here in this library. Yep. 
Yep, we've people, seen people with, you know, shotguns in their backpacks sticking up, long guns, you know. We've seen people with that on their hips. We've had people, sh sh you know, waving their guns around. And, and once they do that, and um, they right. use it in an intimidating manner, they, they are tr trespass. That is not permitted. Um, yes. We had one, yep, we had one, um, a shooting at, at the Pike Branch um, back uh, last September, I think. Um, so that's become a, a bigger issue for libraries. Violence in libraries, um, people are just much angrier nowadays with the divisiveness of everything. And um, we've had people lose their tempers uh, quite a bit more than they used to. So um, this is all leading to a, a need for social workers. We have a social worker program. Um, one of, I don't know, 10 libraries in the country that have started doing this at our central library. And um, it's an official uh, person with social work degree. Um, and that's exclusively what she does. And she, she's working with students from IUPUI. I'm not sure if it's going to be IU or Purdue <laughs> once they split, but um, in their social work program to get students experience working in the libraries too. So we have students that are coming in and doing, you know, internships or um, I'm not sure what that program is called, but they're doing it at Central, but also some of our other libraries like East Washington, East 38th Street, um, some of the locations that have a higher need. And this is all affecting the mental health of library staff. And this is starting to become a regular topic of conferences and journals um, and discussion groups nationally. So it's not just us that are experiencing this, it's a national trend and it's pretty serious. Oh, bomb threats. Um, that's a new tactic that these um, groups, the political activist groups are bringing to libraries. Um, so Chicago um, has, I'm sorry, Illinois has passed a law against banning books. It's the ban book bans law. And so they're basically saying that you can't ban books in public libraries, school libraries. And um, they have seen a huge increase in um, number of bomb threats since that time. And that Senate judiciary hearing I was mentioning that I watched um, immediately after that, there was a rash of bomb threats. And we've been getting them once a week. Um, and we get them in a form that we don't know what location it is. And so we're starting to work with IMPD to figure out how we need to respond to these. Um, there are also, they told us, um, bomb threats happening at other downtown locations like CVS and um, I can't remember the other location, but it was like, really? <laughs> um, so it's, it's a new trend. Um, okay, another shift of challenges of libraries and we've been going on a while, so please tell me if we need to cut it off, okay? We're running up close on one and then it's right hour, so okay so uh, we really go a little over that but. okay um cost of ebooks and e audiobooks you may not be aware that they are twice to three times to five times the cost for public libraries than it is from the average consumer average consumer might pay 9.99 for an ebook they're kind of tapping it around that point we pay 20 30 dollars for an ebook audiobooks um on cd are $45, they're $120 for us in ebook format, e audiobook format, I mean. So when the pandemic happened, we, um, we shifted one third of our physical budget to ebooks and e audiobooks because of the demand had increased. And once we opened that Pandora's box, we can't put it back in, that's for sure. We shifted you know, a third of our physical budget to e and it was immediately eaten up. But think about the cost of it. We only got half the number of titles or a third the number of titles for that amount of you know, investment because of the price difference. So that's a huge problem for us. We're not getting as much as we can if for physical materials as we can get for E and the demand and growth for E is just continues to, to grow and grow. So that feeds into this other big problem that libraries are facing is rising costs, inflation, um, increasing cost of supplies and shipping and utilities, construction, and then also in the softer area, salaries, um, wanting to have a living minimum wage um, and benefits all increasing as well. And then um, we have been having um, expansion of branches throughout our system. Um, we've added five new locations. Um, some of them are removes of branches in the last um, 10 years, but we haven't had an increase in salary. So we can't add more people. We're working with the same people we had 10 years ago with five more buildings. 
And then I mentioned the ebook uh, versus physical cost. And in Marion County, we get a fraction of a percent of the local income tax, also known as county option income tax. In other parts of the state, they get 20%, 10%. So we're constantly going to the um, city county council and trying to you know, make a case for us. So it's not all negative. That was all the negative challenging stuff. The good things are things like we have a whole new leadership team and things are settling down with us. The city county council and the library board's support and confidence is growing with our new leader, Greg Hill, um, who started, I think back in April. Um, we're growing by leaps and bounds, um, but this is the end of our building plan. We had a 10 year plan and the last of them are the Nora and, and Pike branch renovations. They're both gonna be closed for about a year while we gut them and rebuild them. Um, the Glendale branch you mentioned earlier is moving to a new location. Fort Bend just opened and West Perry. So like I said, you guys knew about all these things already. I'm so impressed. And we have some great programs coming up. Um, you mentioned some of these as well. The uh, Center for Black Literature and Culture is uh, celebrating its sixth anniversary and we have a, an author showcase there. Um, and then our annual uh, lecture series, series we're having um, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, a big name author, uh, presenting at that. And then um, Band Books Week, this isn't public knowledge yet, but John Green is gonna be the speaker at that event. Watch, if you're interested, watch for um, tickets to, to come up. They're gonna go fast, they're free, but they're gonna be signed up for them. And then um, our annual Meet an Author, Be an Author event. Um, impressed that you knew about that. You're already on it, that's great. Um, okay, so how libraries uh, select books. Um, when you have a, a large budget like we do, we are gonna get everything that is book reviewed. Um, so it's a publisher weekly or a school library journal or Kirkus reviews. Um, it's coming out on, on forthcoming lists at these sources, Idlevice and Early Word. And if it's got a major print run and marketing run, we're gonna get a copy of it. Um, and so we use those tools to find out what's coming out being published in the next six months so that we can get our orders in so that they're on our shelves pretty close to when they actually are on bookstore shelves. Um, and then we use major vendors, um, Baker and Taylor, Ingram and Brodart for library suppliers. And that's because of electronic ordering and just the quantity of materials that we order, 20,000 a month or so, um, they're able to uh, supply us with those number of items. A local bookstore, that would be overwhelming for them. Um, and then uh, we use professional reviews. Like I mentioned, all these things are helpful for us to order materials. And um, we have the ability in these tools from Baker and Taylor and their, their business to business portals to look at all the positive reviews that came out this month, all the public library reviews, all the negative reviews we might look at, but not, might not buy them. And then for specialty areas, we might look at blogs specifically for those areas that won't have the big name sellers on them, but you know, um, mid-list authors on them. So um, the person who does adult fiction, you know, looks at specialty blogs for crime fiction, history, um, romance, urban fiction, all those things. Um, we have a couple of tools we in, use internally. Collection HQ is one of them. And uh, this helps us identify where we have overstock and understocked, which means it's uh, being used and we don't we have enough of the authors or we don't have enough of the authors. Um, so looking at um, the middle one where there's a big orange bar and a little tiny blue bar, um, that is adult Spanish, okay? <laughs> we have a, a mission to build a, a collection for world language speakers to come and use it, but they're not here yet. They don't know about us yet. Um, whereas the far left one um, is um, audiobooks on CD, mystery genre. Um, and you can see that we are plenty, we're understocked for that, and we need branches that need more copies of those. Um, so that's a tool that we might use. And this one shows us branch by branch, um, who the, under mystery, I think this was just mystery, not large print or audiobook, just regular books, who is understocked and who's overstocked. And the branches know they need more of that particular, and they'll pull it in based on this from another location. And this tool allows them to do that. We have a floating collection, which means that a book lands at this location, initially gets checked out um, and they're returned at this location, it now lives here. A patron from this branch requests it, it gets sent there, they check it out and they return it there and it lives there. So it moves around the system. Um, we don't have individual branch <laughs> legends. 
And then the selection team did all that work to research it and find what they're going to order. We have two paraprofessionals, order specialists, who do the actual ordering of it through business to business portals. And um, that electronic ordering makes it possible for just two people to do that. And then we occasionally use Amazon for wood language items, out of print items, and local authors that aren't carried by the bigger vendors. This last slide talks about marketing your books for libraries and um, encouraging you to find a distributor. Even if you're publishing self-published, you can work with Ingram Spark or Publish Drive to then distribute it to these bigger library vendors like Baker and Taylor or Ingram um, so that libraries can buy it from these bigger systems and make it easier and more efficient with that electronic ordering. But I also encourage you to work with your local library who will go to buy Amazon if you're a local author to buy your books. Um, get professional reviews um, and even community re re reviews on Goodreads or um, Amazon. That's going to help boost your um, awareness of your book and help libraries know that they want to purchase it. Oh, and Amazon um, eBooks is a challenge. If you want your books to be available, your eBooks to be available to libraries, you can't publish it through Amazon. They have a proprietary system and they will not let libraries carry their eBooks. A lot of other ones will let you list them in Overdrive and Libby um, to sell your eBooks. And then for the actual material, we encourage you, you to use an editor. Everybody has a certain you know, style and they think it's perfect, but in order for it to meet standards in the um, industry, we encourage you to use an editor, especially for children's books where certain age groups need to see a certain size fonts and number of words on a page and a certain vocabulary and editors can help make sure that, that that's leg legible for young kids. We get many you know, um, self-published books where it's too many words on a page and it's too high of a vocabulary, things like that. It's gotta be a sturdy published format. Paperback's fine, but not a spiral bound book or a stapled book. Um, and then um, as a local author, provide a review copy to your local library and that will give them um, the ability to see your work and purchase more copies of it and um, attend local author events like we've talked about before, meet an author, be an author is a big one here. The Center for Black Literature and Culture also has an author showcase. Um, I think um, one of your gentlemen is gonna be at that one. And um, we have others, Juneteenth has a, a book fair as well. So look at your library, reach out to your library and ask them about local author fairs and get on the list early because they snap up really quick. That a CBLC one, um, uh, Build, they have 34 tables filled in less than 24 hours. Okay, so thank you. Um, that's the questions. end of the slides. A couple really quick questions. Yes. Um, this, I probably should have um, seen this a little bit sooner. But, uh, one of our members wants to know what the library policy is on knives. If guns are okay, I guess knives are fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's legislation dealing with lives, uh, knives or other weapons. Um, honestly, I, I don't know. And um, there was another question. Um, what is the Band Book event? Uh, Band Book Week. We we celebrate it every week with um, uh, displays, but also usually we have programs. When is it? It's the first week of October. And first I don't have a October. date for John Green yet. They are, you know, um, we have the date, but they're not announcing it yet because it's got to go out with a press release and the announcement of him being speaking and everybody signing up all at once. Yes. Yes. Um, speak at library board meetings. If there's challenges going up, you know, to the library board about things, about, you know, with things that you don't agree with because they're pro censorship, speak up and, and tell the other side of it. Write to your library board members as well. Good question. Any others? Hey, thank you. De Deb, don't trip over the wires. I'm to go this <laughs> thank way. you. Thank you so much. That was really That's a great program. I hope I, I can tell everybody here enjoyed this as much as I did. So thank you so much for sharing your time, your knowledge. It was great. Right. And that brings an end to the program. Diana, come up and log off. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Would you give me there's a couple of bookmarks that might be in